Today, I'll be discussing an approach to acute chest pain. There are a huge number of diseases that can present with chest pain. The best diagnostic framework organizes these many etiologies by organ systems, and I'll go through each one at a time, starting with cardiovascular. We can consider the cardiovascular system to be comprised of the pericardium, the myocardium, the endocardium, which is really the valves, the conduction system, and the blood vessels. So let's fill in some diagnoses. What are diseases of the pericardium that can present with chest pain? Pericarditis, which is inflammation of the pericardium. With the myocardium, of course, there is myocarditis, but also rarely a heart failure exacerbation can present with chest pain, since oxygen consumption is dependent on wall tension, and wall tension is dependent upon intraventricular volume. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a condition called tak Takotsubo cardiomyopathy can both also be associated with chest pain. With the valves, you might be tempted to say endocarditis. However, endocarditis does not actually cause pain, at least not directly. However, severe aortic stenosis can. Any sufficiently fast tachyarrhythmia can lead to something called demand ischemia, in which the primary problem is not lack of oxygen supply to the myocardium, but rather is excessive oxygen demand. And last, with the vessels, obviously the acute obstruction of a coronary artery can cause pain. Acute pain from an occluded artery that is associated with an elevation of troponin is, by definition, an acute MI, whereas acute pain from an occlusion that is not associated with an elevation of troponin is unstable angina. Together, acute MIs and unstable angina are referred to as acute coronary syndrome because in the first several hours after pain onset, it may not be possible to distinguish them from one another. An uncommon but very life-threatening etiology in this subcategory is aortic dissection, which is when the layers in the aortic wall start separating. When the dissection involves the aortic valve, it can lead to acute aortic insufficiency. If it spreads to a carotid artery, it can lead to a massive stroke. And the dissection, which uh, can also walk, weaken the wall to the point of rupture and very rapid exsanguination. One final etiology that belongs under vessels in the cardiovascular system is a hypertensive emergency of any cause. In this case, a very high afterload increases myocardial oxygen demand, and patients can develop demand ischemia analogous to that seen with tachyarrhythmias and severe volume overload. Let's move on to the lungs. The relevant functional components of the lungs include the pleura, the alveoli, the airways, and the pulmonary vasculature. Pleuritis, also known as pleurisy, can cause chest pain, as can a pneumothorax, which is when a tear or hole in one of the pleural layers results in air getting into the pleural space. Pleural effusions, in the absence of concurrent inflammation, usually do not cause pain. Regarding diseases of the airways, asthma attacks frequently cause pain. In the alveoli, there is pneumonia, and in the vasculature, there is both acute pulmonary embolism and an initial presentation of pulmonary hypertension from any cause. When it comes to lung cancer, while it can cause chest pain, it's actually not a very common primary symptom at initial diagnosis, unless the tumor has spread to the pleural space, invaded other local structures, or has metastasized to a rib. The next relevant organ system to consider is the GI system. In the esophagus, chest pain could be from gastroesophageal reflux disease, better known by its acronym GERD, esophagitis, or esophageal spasm. And in the stomach, although gastritis and peptic ulcer disease more commonly cause epigastric pain, they can on occasion present with chest pain instead. With the musculoskeletal system, rib fractures will obviously cause pain, but there is also a condition called costochondritis, which is local inflammation where a rib joint, uh, where, I'm sorry, where a rib joins the sternum. There are a few remaining miscellaneous causes, including severe anemia, which reduces oxygen delivery to the myocardium, herpes zoster, also known as shingles. Zoster has a vesicular rash isolated to a single dermatome that accompanies the pain. However, in a minority of patients, the onset of pain may precede the rash by a few hours to a few days. Acute intoxication of cocaine or amphetamines can cause chest pain. Sickle cell anemia can cause a complication called acute chest syndrome, 
in which there is acute vaso occlusion in the pulmonary microvasculature. And finally, some patients will have psychogenic chest pain as either a manifestation of panic attacks or a manifestation of somatization. Before getting into the diagnostic algorithm, I want to first define a few characteristics of chest pain that are frequently relevant. First and most importantly, is the chest pain exertional? Meaning either does it start or get worse with exertion, and is it relieved or improved with rest? Is it positional? Meaning does it worsen or improve when the patient adopts a particular position, such as lying down or sitting up? Is it pleuritic? Pleuritic chest pain is pain that worsens when taking an unusually deep breath. Pleuritic pain can also be that worsened with coughing. A common term that I don't personally like is reproducible chest pain. What someone means when talking about reproducible chest pain is that the patient's pain is reproduced specifically with physical pressure applied to a focal part of the chest wall. A preferable way to convey that same information is to report focal chest wall tenderness when describing the exam. When approaching the diagnosis of a patient presenting with chest pain, the most important consideration is to determine as quickly as possible if the patient might have an emergent, life-threatening problem, specifically acute coronary syndrome, a pulmonary embolism, an aortic dissection, or a pneumothorax. If they are hemodynamically unstable, you need to assume that they have one of those four problems until proven otherwise. So how do you differentiate between them? Well, it's based on the description of the pain, their past medical history, physical exam, and quick bedside diagnostic tests. With acute coronary syndrome, the pain typically comes on over a few minutes and is substernal in location. Although it is classically taught that pain from ACS radiates down the left arm, Evidence suggests that pain radiating to the right arm or to both arms is as predictive of ACS, if not more so. Pain can also radiate to the jaw. Pain in ACS is usually exertional and non pleuritic. It is most often qualitatively described as a pressure or a tightness. Risk factors the patients may have could include smoking, diabetes, hypertension, or hyperlipidemia. The physical exam is often normal but on occasion may reveal an S3, elevated JVP, and lung crackles if the patient has already developed secondary heart failure. The diagnostic tests include an ECG, which may rule in an MI by showing ST elevations, or may show something called dynamic changes, in which the morphology of ST segments and T waves change with changes in the severity of the patient's pain. Remember that a significant minority of patients presenting to the ED with an acute MI will have an unremarkable ECG at presentation. The chest X-ray is typically normal. Troponins are also ordered to help diagnose acute MIs. However, they can also be elevated in PEs and myocarditis, among other diagnoses. Something that you should notice is not listed as a feature of pain related to ACS is relief with nitroglycerin. Historically, it was thought that a patient presenting to the ED with chest pain was more likely to have myocardial ischemia if the pain was relieved by nitro. However, this has been shown to be untrue. Relief with nitroglycerin is useless as a diagnostic test. Moving on to PE, the pain typically comes on over seconds to minutes, lateralizes to the side of the embolism without radiation, is non-exertional, but is pleuritic. The single most common word to qualitatively describe pain from a PE is sharp, but this is not so consistent as to put much weight on it. The past medical history may reveal a hypercoagulable state, such as recent hospitalization, immobilization, or an active malignancy. Physical exam is usually unremarkable, but patients can have evidence of a DVT in their legs, or very rarely will have a right-sided S3 or right ventricular heave if the PE is unusually severe. Chest X-ray is usually normal. ECG, most often shows sinus tachycardia rather than the frequently discussed classic S1, Q3, T3 pattern. If clinical suspicion of a PE is relatively low, a normal D-dimer test will rule it out completely, but patients with either high suspicion of PE 
or those with an elevated D-dimer should undergo a CT angiogram is sufficiently stable enough for the trip to radiology. In an aortic dissection, the onset of pain is over seconds to minutes. It will be central in location with radiation to the back. It is non-exertional and non-pleuritic. Patients will most often use the word tearing to describe it. Past medical history may reveal either hypertension or smoking, both of which are significant risk factors for dissection. In patients who have not yet ruptured, the blood pressure is usually extremely elevated. Hypotension in the setting of dissection means either rupture or acute damage of the aortic valve. The physical exam may reveal discordant blood pressures between the two arms, depending on the precise location of the tear. A chest x-ray might show widening of the mediastinum, but this is insufficiently sensitive or specific to be clinically helpful. ECG is not at all helpful in making this diagnosis. If a dissection is suspected and the patient is sufficiently hemodynamically stable, a CT angiogram should be performed. If the patient is too unstable to leave the emergency department for the scan, an emergent transesophageal echocardiogram can be performed at the bedside. Finally, with a pneumothorax, the onset of pain is usually very abrupt, often instantaneous. It lateralizes to the affected side, is non-exertional, is pleuritic, and is described as sharp. The patient may have a history of COPD or cystic fibrosis, which are risk factors. The physical exam will reveal unilateral diminished or absent breath sounds and hyperresonance. A pneumothorax large enough to be clinically relevant will always be visible on routine x-ray, and further testing beyond this is usually not necessary. Now, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, remember that they still might have one of those four diagnoses, and you still need to consider them. However, in this situation, you also have more time to consider all those other diagnoses in the framework. Stable patients should still get an ECG and a chest x-ray. Additional testing beyond this, for example, troponins and D-dimers, is based on clinical suspicion. There, beyond this, there is no specific next step in the diagnostic algorithm, but there are features that increase the probability of particular diagnoses. So for example, pain from pericarditis may be pleuritic and is relieved by sitting up and leaning forward. The exam may have a pericardial friction rub, but it's usually absent. The ECG commonly reveals diffuse ST elevations in more than one vascular territory. Pain from myocarditis is associated with an elevated troponin, but unlike with ACS, is non-exertional and lasts hours or longer. Pain from pleuritis lateralizes to the affected side and is pleuritic. It may be associated with a pleural friction rub, um, but as with a pericardial rub, it's usually absent. A chest x-ray usually reveals an associated pleural effusion. Chest pain that is related to eating, or which comes on minutes to a few hours after lying down, is suggestive of GERD. Chest pain that is associated with very focal chest wall tenderness suggests an MSK origin. And pain that is described as burning, and which is limited to a single dermatome that wraps around to the back, suggests zoster. Frustratingly, for both patients and clinicians, if the four most deadly diagnoses are ruled out, the patient will more likely than not be discharged home without a specific diagnosis. It is surprisingly common for patients to come to the emergency room with chest pain, get admitted for 24 hours for a so-called chest pain rule-out admission, receive their serial troponin testing, telemetry monitoring, and plus or minus an inpatient cardiac stress test, with all of the data resulting as unremarkable. There's no standard as to how such admissions should be labeled at the time of discharge. I prefer giving most of these patients a discharge diagnosis of nonspecific non-cardiac chest pain, implying that it's likely either GI or MSK related and is not life-threatening. That's not satisfying, but it reflects the reality that further testing beyond what was already mentioned does not have a significant enough yield to justify it barring unusual circumstances, and provided that the chest pain has self-resolved, which it usually does. If the chest pain becomes recurrent, then additional testing as an outpatient can be considered, including EGD, additional investigations into ischemia, or a diagnostic trial of either a PPI or anti-inflammatory medication.
Take home points for this video. There are many causes of acute chest pain, which range from very benign to imminently life-threatening. The most important diagnostic step is to rule out these life-threatening etiologies, acute coronary syndrome, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, and pneumothorax. To identify the presence of these diagnoses, the most important pieces of data are the characteristics of the pain, the patient's past medical history, vital signs, ECG, and chest x-ray. In a significant portion of hemodynamically stable patients presenting with a self-limited episode of chest pain will have no definitive diagnosis made, even after a 24-hour stay for observation.